Picture this, you have a modern gaming PC that can play games at smooth frame rates. No longer are you capped at 30 or 60 FPS like you are on a console. And then you come up with the amazing idea to play some of your favourite retro games. You dream of how these older titles will now run at extremely high frame rates, but to your dismay, the game is capped to 60 FPS. You don't panic just yet as you can tweak some of the config files or use a mod to uncap that frame rate. And then suddenly when you have this frame rate uncapped, all hell lets loose. Your cutscenes are zoomed in, you're dying from such small heights, and your car handles so poorly. If this has been you before, then you'll get the frustration. But luckily, you clicked on this video, and now you're about to find out about the amazing program known as lossless scaling. With just a few clicks, you can double your frame rate, which isn't anything new to modern titles, but for retro games, this is game changing for obvious reasons. And the best part is, you do not need the latest graphics cards to access it. Here on Retro Renew, we like to get older games looking and playing their best, so let's explore lossless scaling together and see what we can do with it. Its limitations, drawbacks, as well as what situations you should use it in the most. Before we dive deep into the program, it's important I give you a brief rundown of what it does. Lossless scaling is a program mainly used to upscale lower resolutions to your monitor's native resolution. There's a lot of flexibility for each situation as well because the program offers you a lot of different technologies. But what we're interested in is the program's ability to generate frames. If you've never heard of this kind of tech, then in the most basic forms possible, it takes a rendered frame, guesses what frame will come next, and then slots it after the real frame. This means you'll see a real frame, followed by a fake frame, and then back to the real one. This doubles your frame rate. The program itself can be found on Steam. Unfortunately, it's not a free program, but the price is extremely reasonable at 589. It also could not be easier to use. Since we're only going to be looking at frame gen in this video, we're going to ignore the left side and focus on the tab called frame generation. There'll be an option that lets you choose between the different versions of the frame gen. As recorded in this video, the latest one is 3.0, but you should choose the latest version available to you at the time. The first option dictates how many frames are going to be generated. 2x means essentially that your frame rate will double, so if you set it to 2x and your game is running at 60 FPS, you'll end up with 120 FPS. The more that you bump up this setting, the more frame rate that you'll get, but it also means that the more fake frames there are than real frames. This will cause a lot of artifacting that we'll get into later. The way this program works is also very similar to using effects like in Reshade. It's essentially an overlaying effect. What this means for you though is that unlike say for example DLSS frame gen, which has access to vector data in order to know the difference between your player model, scenery, and the UI, lossless scaling only knows the fully rendered image. And because it only has this rendered image to work with, there are a few downsides that we'll get into in a bit. Resolution scale will be the resolution of the rendered fake frame. So I highly recommend that you keep this at 100%, but turn it down as a last resort. This program can be performance heavy sometimes, but I would recommend doing other methods to get more frames rather than turning down the resolution scale, as it can look pretty bad. Inside the rendering tab, HDR support should be turned on if your game or your monitor are outputting HDR of course, and G-Sync as well if you have that enabled. My monitor does support HDR, but I leave it off all of the time, so I'm gonna leave it off here, and I also have G-Sync enabled, so I'll enable that option. Draw FPS is your run-of-the-mill FPS overlay, but what it will do differently is show you the starting FPS and the FPS after generating your frames. I'm going to be using this in this video in order to showcase the program, as normal FPS overlays don't show the new frame rate. Now the capture API setting is something that you need to change if your game is not being detected right by the program. It's important to note though that it's not always the API's fault that the game is not being detected. Lossless scaling needs the game to be in windowed or borderless windowed mode, so games that are restricted to full screen exclusive are not supported. If a game only has the option to be full screen or windowed, then you can select windowed and then use a program like Borderless Gaming to convert it to a borderless window. This will just make alt tabbing a lot easier. Now the last setting is important for any of you that have more than one monitor. The multi display mode option should be switched on if you have more than one monitor, and off if you only have a single monitor. In my experience, what will happen is if you alt tab to your second monitor, the program will lose focus of the game. Then scaling will switch itself off, 
but with this multi-display option enabled, this won't happen anymore. There is also another settings panel in the top right, which can do things like set a hotkey to start scaling, it can start the program as admin, which can be useful in instances where it's again struggling to take control of the game, and also start the program whenever your PC boots up. Now getting into actually trying some games out with this program, I decided to try Dark Souls Remastered. This game was actually initially capped at 30 frames on consoles I believe, but now on PC it runs at 60 without much issues. But the 60 FPS cap is in place due to the game's speed being tied to the frame rate. Now of course here if we uncap the frame rate, or if we cap the frame rate lower, it's going to slow down or speed up the game. So instead we're going to alt tab to lossless scaling, set it to 2x and hit scale. You'll be given 5 seconds to focus the window that you want scaled. So after tapping back into Dark Souls, you'll see in the top left we've increased the frame rate from 60 to 120. I noticed straight away as like I said, this has a performance hit, and my FPS actually dropped from a stable 60 to just under 50. I quickly found out though this was because I was running some reshade effects, so turning those off gave me a solid 60 again. Again if you don't have anything to switch off or lower, then you're gonna have to resort to that resolution scale setting that we mentioned earlier. Now to truly appreciate this kind of bump in frame rate, you're also going to need a high refresh rate monitor. In my case I have a 240Hz display, and I could immediately feel the extra fluidity of 120fps. Unfortunately though, no matter what I do here on YouTube, due to its compression, it's extremely hard for you to see the difference, especially when the video is going to be recorded and rendered at 60fps. But we can slow the footage down and take a closer look at any artifacts this is or isn't causing. And as you can see in this clip, as I rotate the camera around my character, artifacts are shown around certain parts. This is especially exaggerated when doing actions like rolling. Of course, when you're playing the game for real, we're not zooming in and slowing down the footage, so it's gonna make it look bad. But this is more to understand the drawbacks of the program, because, like I said, in normal gameplay, these artifacts do not ruin the experience. If we, however, turn up the frames from two times to four times, you'll see now we are going from 60 all the way to 240. This is in my opinion way too much, especially when you're going from a frame rate like 60 all the way up to that 240, it's pretty much unplayable. I'd never recommend anyone go this far because as you can see the artifacts are super exaggerated, so much to the point that simple slow camera turns quickly turn into mush. If you were say running a game at 240 FPS to begin with, and then you enable this option, it would probably be better because there are more real frames to insert those fake frames. It's also important to be aware that the jump from 60 FPS to 120 FPS is so much more noticeable than 120 to 240. So you are getting this big trade off of all these artifacts for not really much gain. I wanted to try this out on different games of course, that had an even more dramatic FPS lock, so I chose Bully. Certainly Headmaster! Come along boy, I haven't got all day. We looked at this game a few videos ago on a best way to play episode, and figured out that running at anything over 30 breaks a lot of the game. At the time, I couldn't give any advice on dealing with it, and so I recommended that you just slowly get used to it as you play. But let's see if lossless scaling can save it. Again, it's hard to translate how choppy 30fps feels on YouTube, but man, booting this game up and moving around was painful. Turning on frame gen and putting it to two times got us up to 60 FPS with similar results to Dark Souls, however in general gameplay I did feel that I could tell the artifacts were there. And I think it mainly has to do with the fact that this technology works better when there are more real frames to work with. So in Bully's case, it's only got 30 frames to work with, so bumping 30 to 60 can look quite bad. I tried out all the other options including the three times setting, and the side by sides here show you just how much each one changes. Again, I would recommend the two times the most. Another great use case for this program is old fast paced FPS games like Turok 2. The reason these are great is because the twitchy nature of boomer shooters benefit greatly from 120fps. This was a good example of how the program can mess up when it comes to UI. Since we have a crosshair in this game, moving quickly can cause waves to form around it. This is completely unavoidable due to what we explained earlier, in that the program only receives a rendered image, complete with the user interface intact. Despite the obvious drawbacks like this though, so far I was pretty impressed with the results. I think the best way to think about this program is to not fully rely on it to perform magic, 
but rather use it as one of the many tools to improve your gameplay experience in retro games. On this channel, we've explored stuff like CRT shaders for reshade, texture packs for emulation, and of course, mods for PC. And this can just be added on top of that as a quick and easy way to get more out of a locked FPS situation. The part I was most excited about trying though, was the fact that this program works on emulators. And of course, emulating consoles, most games are capped at 30 or 60. This is where I had a ton of fun trying out some games that I'm used to playing at lower frame rates, but now getting to see them at 60 or 120 FPS. There is a setting specific to PCSX2 that I found that needs to be checked in order for this to work. You need to go to graphic settings, advanced, and check skip presenting duplicate frames. If you don't see this option, then you gotta go to tools and show advanced settings. Once you do that, all you need to do is scale your games exactly like you did the others. The program worked really well at fast paced racing games like Burnout 3. The amount of blurring effects and particles going everywhere meant that I couldn't really tell any frame gen was going on at all. Same can really be said for Ratchet and Clank as well. I didn't really notice the frame gen was going on as much as other games that I've tried. Devil May Cry as well, pretty much the same thoughts overall. All of these different games that I tried just meant that this program is definitely a case to case basis. So far the worst one out of all of them has been Bully, but since it's locked at 30, I think I would have to deal with it to get that smoother experience. However, Burnout 3 was literally flawless to my eyes. Another great use case that I wanted to mention, whilst not entirely a retro game, would be Bloodborne. It's such a great example of one of those games where it's one of mine and many's favourite game of all time, and it's being locked to a gruelling 30fps. Actually, you know, 30fps wouldn't actually be that bad, it's just that the game also has terrible frame pacing, causing many drops to frame rates as low as 20. If you haven't heard already, the community are making massive strides to get it running on PC through the PS4 emulator, Shad PS4. And I myself got it up and running quite smoothly. It is not in any way easy or quick to set up, so if you want a full video covering it, then let me know in the comments. Anyway, Shad PS4 has patches similar to PCSX2, and the patches for Bloodborne are quite extensive. One of which fixes the frame pacing for 30 FPS, and the other bumps it up to 60. The 60fps patch at the moment causes some crashing, so my recommendation would be to use the 30fps frame pacing patch, and then use lossless scaling to up that to 60. I did also try out 60 though and bumped it up to 120fps, which felt really weird. It's just so strange to see this game running at 120fps after playing it for so long at 30. I think the best use case here would be to stay at that stable 30 however, and boost it to 60 and that way you're getting the less crashing for the same performance as the 60fps patch. Nothing beats native 60fps without frame gen of course, and like we've discovered, frame gen from 30 to 60 is way more distracting than 60 to 120 due to artifacting. And at this point, I had a pretty good understanding of the program and when I myself am going to be using it. To recap in this video though, any game that is locked at 60fps without a doubt should be bumped up to 120 using this program if you want that extra fluidity. And for games that are locked at 30, it is unfortunately far more distracting and hard to get used to, so I can't recommend it. However, depending on how fast or slow the game is, and what effects are layered on top, I could see a scenario where it looks good. Like for example Burnout 3. If that game was 30fps, I would imagine bumping it up to 60 might not look that bad. Of course, the game is fast paced, meaning that there's probably more artifacts going on, but since you're going so fast in the game, you don't really have time to stop and stare at anything. What I'm really excited about though, is not only the future of the program and this tech, but what other tools are out there that I have yet to explore. At some point, I'll probably do a video on Marty's ray tracing shaders, as adding ray tracing to retro games is so interesting to me. But if you guys know of any tool, mod, or literally anything that improves retro games or changes how they look, then please do let me know in the comments. Thank you to all the members here on YouTube and or Patreon. You help greatly at keeping this channel alive, and if you'd like to help out as well, you can join from just £1 a month. You'll get every video's early, as well as a shout out here at the end of the video. If you enjoyed this video and want something similar, then remastering older games with texture packs and why you need to try CRT shaders are great videos that explore more ways to enhance and relive your favourite retro games. See you over there.